Good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Carol Schoenlieb to you today. She is a professor of applied mathematics at the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge. There, she is head of the Cambridge Image Analysis Group, director of the Cantab Capital Institute for Mathematical Information, co-director of the EPSRC Center for Mathematical and Statistical Analysis of Multimodal Clinical Imaging, and since 2011, a fellow of Jesus College, Cambridge. She received her PhD in 2009 from the University of Cambridge. Her research is concerned with the interaction of mathematical sciences and imaging. She has active interdisciplinary collaborations with clinicians, biologists, and physicists on biomedical imaging topics, chemical engineers and plant scientists on image sensing, as well as collaborations with artists and art conservators on digital art restoration. Today, Dr. Shunli will talk to us about deep learning for inverse problems, some recent approaches. Please help me welcome Dr. Shunli. All right. Thank you very much for the really kind introduction, and uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to speak here today. It's my first time at the SIEM CSE, and I'm really impressed by the huge amounts of people here and also the diversity. I really look forward to the next couple of days, uh, which promise to be, in, be really interesting ones. Um, let me actually get rid of this. Um, so what I would like uh, to do in this presentation is to give you uh, an overview of some recent developments in inverse problems uh, to make inverse problem solutions more data-driven by using uh, deep neural networks. And um, so the rough outline will be as follows. First, I'm going to set the stage by uh, telling you how we classically uh, are solving inverse problems by what I call more knowledge-driven inversion approaches. And here I will particularly focus on a subset of functional analytic inversion, which is called variational regularization approaches. And that should really, on the one hand, set the scene, but also motivate why we might think about making certain components in these knowledge-driven approaches more data-driven. And I'll focus there in particular on using neural networks as a way to uh, make them more adaptive to the data that we would like to process. And uh, in this context, I'll uh, also finish with a recent idea that came out of my group in Cambridge, uh, which is um, called uh, uh, a learned regularizer, so parametrizing a regularizer in a variational model with a neural network. And this is really uh, the work of one of my PhD students, Sebastian Lunz, who also talked about this this morning. All right, so just to set the scene, the kind of inverse problems that I would like to focus on in this presentation are inverse imaging problem, where the common feature of all of those is that the measurement space of where I collect the data and the solution space, which is the space where my images live, there are two different spaces. And this will be very important to remember when I talk about deep learning in this context and using deep neural networks to solve such problems. So, um, an inverse problem usually also has an associated forward problem. This means knowing a physical quantity. In my case, this will always be an image. Uh, how do I get to the measurements? This is usually the kind of easy way. The more uh, difficult one, and uh, also practically more relevant one, is the one given the measurements. How do I get back to an image? And uh, if you want to formalize this, this is how I've written it down here. So my measurements are little f. Uh, the quantity, the image I would like to compute from these measurements f is called little u. And the forward operator, the forward process that uh, has been applied to this image u before I measure it is uh, given by this capital uh, T, by um, linear or nonlinear forward operator capital T. And then I put here a little n for any kind of random corruptions uh, your data might have. And in particular, you, you will always have noise in the data that, you, that will actually uh, make this inversion even more challenging. Now, 
the example I show here is an example from positron emission tomography, and it's actually quite a timely example to give this to you today because I just got the very good news this morning that one of my research projects on algorithm development for positron emission tomography has been given funding. So uh, thanks a lot, EPSRC, for giving us the funding to do this. But um, the main uh, thing that I'm showing you here is what the typical measurements look in contrast to the typical type of images we want to compute from these measurements. So very roughly speaking, in positron emission tomography or any kind of computer tomography, um, what you're measuring are line integrals through the human body. And these are line integrals uh, at different angles and at different y-intercepts. So you have parallel lines at different angles. And these are line integrals over a density, which is my image density, that in positron emission tomography is roughly connected to the amount of metabolism that is happening in the human body, okay? And so from this parametrization here, I've parametrized here the measurements with respect to the angle and the y-intercept. Um, from these typically noisy and also incomplete measurements, because as you can imagine, you don't measure all the angles and all the uh, parallel lines, from these line integrals you want to get back to an image, okay? And this is actually a very old problem going back uh, to Johann Radon, who was an Austrian mathematician uh, in 1917, where he asked himself, very independent of imaging, uh, computer tomography didn't exist then, uh, can you reconstruct the function from its line integrals? So why are these inverse problems challenging? They're challenging because they're typically ill-posed. And they're ill-posed for various reasons. Uh, the example I give here on the right is uh, a shadow casting example, so you have uh, a 3D object, in this case you have two hands casting a shadow onto a wall. Uh, if you know the posture of the hands and if you know the light source, where it came from, then the, 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 the forward problem of uh, predicting what the shadow looks is a kind of easy task. On the other hand, the associated inverse problem, knowing the shadow, what did the 3D hand posture look like is, is actually the challenging one. And this is a typical example for an underdetermined inverse problem, okay? Just from 2D information, how do you get back to a 3D object that has originated these 2D projections? Um, various other reasons why inverse problems are ill-posed. Um, the typical one, in particular in medical imaging, is that your forward operators are usually compact and, um, uh, and have an infinite dimensional range, uh, which uh, results in either the inverse being unbounded or discontinuous. And then you always have noise, which actually makes this whole thing about the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the inverse being discontinuous uh, a problem because you get instabilities. Okay, uh, so your inverse problem usually is not a stable thing to uh, solve, and that is something that worries us, that the solution doesn't de continuously depend on the measurements that you take. So in particular in the context of noise, this is an issue because if you perturb your measurements a little bit, you don't want your reconstructions to go like this, okay? And then there is almost never uniqueness, so this is also one issue here. So how to deal with this? Um, and maybe let me say that mathematicians initially were not very interested in, in uh, 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 not very interested in inverse problems because of the fact that they are ill-posed usually. Um, but then they found some ways around, and so, so now there is a whole community of mathematicians who are working on inverse problems. There are two main kind of groups. Um, one of them is this approach of functional analytic inversion. Um, which turns the ill-posed problem uh, into a well-posed one by various techniques uh, and then uh, constructs one solution uh, to the inverse problem. Uh, the other one is a more statistical approach, a Bayesian estimation approach, where you're not looking for one single uh, answer, not one single reconstruction, but you're looking for a distribution of those, and then you can do things like uncertainty quantification and stuff like this. I'm not going to talk about this. What I'm going to focus on in order to 
bring us a bit closer to how I understand uh, deep neural networks in this context is variational regularization approaches, which is a subclass of functional analytic inversion. So in variational regularization approaches, you start with your ill-posed inverse problem, and then you aim to compute an approximation to this inverse problem uh, as a minimizer of a functional that usually consists of two terms. Um, one of them is the so-called data fidelity or data discrepancy term, which uh, you could think of in most scenarios as the least squares fit between the measurements and your forward model. Um, and that really encapsulates the knowledge you have about the connection between the measurements and the solution you want to compute from these measurements. Um, and then the other important part, which now turns this ill-posed problem into a well-posed one, is the regularization term. And this is this uh, functional R of U um, that models some prior information you have about the type of solutions you expect uh, to, uh, uh, that you want to compute uh, for, your, uh, for your inverse problem. And uh, typically in these in this variational regularization approaches, this is called regularization because it, it, in it incorporates some smoothness assumptions you have about the type of use you want to compute. Uh, and then you have a regularization parameter here, little alpha, that balances your belief into the measurements against the need for regularization. There is a connection also to the Bayesian approach, of course. Uh, in some scenarios, when this regularizer and the discrepancy term have particular forms, you could think of the discrepancy term as the log likelihood of your posterior distribution uh, and the regularization term as the log of a prior that you have about the type of use you want to compute. A typical type of regularization that uh, has been extremely successful um, in the last uh, 30 years or so has been this idea of um, expanding your solution U or representing your solution U in a sparse way in some kind of dictionary or some representation. So to assume that the reconstruction U can be sparsely represented in some ways. And um, that means a lot of times this regularization term in image processing, but in lots of other inverse problems as well, uh, is given by an L1 penalty. And a very successful L1 penalty is the so-called total variation, which means you assume that the gradient of U uh, is sparse, which means that the image you want to reconstruct is, uh, is constant, or the gradient of U is zero in almost all places, and just non-zero in a few significant ones, which are the edges, okay? So you, you, uh, you assume that most of the characteristic information in images is contained in the edges of this image, okay? And this is really very, very successfully used um, in inverse imaging problems uh, and has a lot of different um, uh, uh, fields of applications where this, is, uh, where, where this had quite an impact. So what does it do? Just to show you very briefly what this does, um, so this is now, not strictly speaking, not an inverse problem. Uh, my forward operator T here is just the identity, so this is just an image denoising problem. Um, and I'm using total variation regularization to denoise this image, but it shows you the typical properties that this regularization has. Um, so this image here on the left is my F, this is the noisy image, and on the right, is a minimizer of this total variation regularization problem for an appropriate choice of alpha. And what you see is that this actually works quite well with our assumption of, you know, I want to preserve these continuities and everywhere else uh, I'm well off approximating this with a constant intensity, apart from the regions where this actually isn't true, where you have intensities which are linearly increasing or decreasing, uh, where you can see, I don't know if you actually can see that, but where you can see that there are these blocky-like artifacts that are appearing uh, because you're still trying to approximate something that isn't piecewise constant with something piecewise constant. And this is this particular interplay between total variation and L2 which is doing this. Um, 
well, you could think maybe a sparsity assumption on the gradient is not such a good thing. Maybe I should, if I know that my intensities are linearly increasing and decreasing, I might think about sparsity of the Hessian, but then you get nicely, nice approximations in these areas, but you get blurred out edges. And then there are people who thought about combining the, the, the two worlds with each other and decomposing your image into parts where a, sparse, a sparsity assumption on the gradient is more appropriate and in parts where a sparsity assumption on the Hessian is more appropriate. Um, and uh, doing this decomposition actually poses your regularizer as, a, as an additional minimization problem, okay? Um, so there are various different ways. This is, by the way, called total generalized variation of second order, and it doesn't even stop there, okay? There is a whole zoo of different regularizers that people have introduced over the years, um, and there is a no one-fit-all solution. So all of these regularizers have their advantages and disadvantages. They can represent certain structures better than others, and uh, most importantly, all of these regularizers are limited by our limitation of modeling things, by our limitation of formalizing structures and images. And so this really motivates maybe thinking about parametrizing certain components in such typical knowledge-driven inversion approaches by um, for instance, neural networks, and then learning these parameters that, uh, that these neural networks are composed of from appropriate examples. And so this is the whole idea here. Um, the whole idea is that if we are starting with something like a neural network that has millions of parameters, we know from a lot of examples, recent examples also in the literature, that these neural networks have a really, really, really strong power of being able to extract uh, the, the main building blocks of images, okay? So here you have images of faces. You train a network uh, to represent such face images, for instance, to extract the important components for classifying these faces. And uh, what it does, it picks out uh, kind of these building blocks. So think of those maybe as some kind of dictionary you are using in order to represent these faces. And so wouldn't it be nice if we could use something like this, some idea like this, also to come up with better ways to compute uh, inverse, to, to solve inverse problems, and in particular to regularize inverse problems. Um, so the main portion of the talk will be on deep neural networks, but I just uh, thought I'll tell you that this is not, you know, this idea of making inverse problems more data-driven is not new. Um, so there are a couple of uh, examples that I've pulled up here where people are using uh, ideas, uh, different ideas to make uh, inverse problem solution more data driven. One of them is in the context of sparse coding and dictionary learning, uh, where you are expanding your solution U uh, as a linear combination of dictionary elements phi i with uh, coefficients gamma i. Uh, and then in typical sparse coding, you fix the dictionary and then you compute your solution U uh, by computing these, these uh, coefficients gamma with a sparsity assumption on the gamma vector. Uh, but in dictionary learning, you could also make the dictionary elements themselves part of your optimization problem. Another one is black box denoiser. So this is also a kind of nice idea for combining any kind of denoising approach, which could be learned. Uh, with, uh, with, with typical inverse problems we want to solve by decoupling the solution of the inverse problem from the type of regularization you would like to use. So your kind of plugin is also called plug and play prior or the recent uh, kind of further development of this is regularization by denoising where you are again solving a variational regularization approach, but in this case, you've set up a regularizer such that it encodes your smoothing properties in terms of a kind of black box denoiser, and you can choose whatever you want for that. Okay, you can train that separately. Um, the last uh, example before I turn to neural networks is bi-level optimization. This is really also the, uh, the, the type of approaches that I've started out with looking into more data-driven approaches to inverse problems where you again start with your variational regularization approach. So this guy here, 
But then you parameterize, for instance, the regularizer in a certain way, and you are learning the parameters that this regularizer is made up of by evaluating a solution to this variational regularization approach with respect to some evaluation criterion that you that you are optimizing over. Okay, so you are optimizing the, these parameters lambda with respect to some evaluation criterion, and in, for instance, a supervised learning framework, this could be you are comparing the output, the solution to your regularization approach with some ground truth that you have. And then you are optimizing the parameters in order to fit this ground truth. And then there's deep neural networks, and this is uh, what I want to focus on now. So this idea of using very high level parameterizations for certain components in my inverse problem solutions. Um, just to set the scene, uh, how uh, I think about neural networks, um, this is a very simple example of a feed-forward neural network, where now uh, you uh, can think of uh, solving an inverse problem, for instance, in the following way. You start with an initial guess that I call here u0, and then you apply a finite number, capital K, uh, operations to this initial input that uh, consists of affine transformations and nonlinearities. And uh, you are learning, in particular, these affine transformations, so these uh, linear operators A and the so-called biases B. You are learning those, again, you're minimizing over phi, uh, uh, you're minimizing over theta with respect, again, to some evaluation criterion, some quality measure for the output that uh, comes, uh, that is the result of these, this last iteration that is applied to your, uh, to your input function u0. And again, this evaluation criterion could be that you learn this with respect to a lot of examples you have in a training set. <coughs> okay, so this is roughly how you can think of this. And then deep, deep learning just means you have a lot of these iterations, so your capital K is large, and uh, you're learning uh, the, uh, these, uh, these, uh, um, you're, you're learning the, the, the A's and the B's, okay? All right, so how do people now combine this idea with inverse problems? And one thing, again, to keep in mind is the, the, the very differentiating setup of inverse imaging problems with respect to the typical kind of things where deep learning is used is that the measurement space and the solution space, my image space, are different spaces, okay? So how do people solve this? So one example is fully learned models. So fully learned, and now um, here this is a completely, a, a very incomplete list of contributions. I'm just, I just pick it out some just to give you an idea what has happened there. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, one example here of such a fully learned model that was published in Nature last year, where the idea is you do the whole process from measurements to image, you do this with a neural network, okay? And the example I'm showing you here is for magnetic resonance tomography. So in magnetic resonance tomography, your measurements live in Fourier space, so you are measuring Fourier coefficients of an image you would like to reconstruct. And usually you don't, so the number of Fourier coefficients, here the resolution in Fourier space corresponds to the resolution of the image you want to reconstruct. And uh, usually the more Fourier coefficients you acquire, the longer the acquisition takes. So usually you want to under samples. You don't have all the Fourier coefficients given. Again, this makes it an underdetermined um, uh, an underdetermined inverse problem. Um, so from these undersampled Fourier measurements that are also typically noisy, you would like to get back to an image. So fully learned approaches do this by first, uh, design, so by designing a network that has a couple of fully connected dense layers that are necessary in order to do the step from, from, from Fourier space to image space. And then a few convolutional layers that are, that are basically responsible for the regularization. Okay? So after, do, after training such a network on what they did there was 50,000 brain images, you get results like this. So actually they were successful. This actually works. Um, 
So what you see here is the following. On the very left, you see uh, this is uh, called the sampling pattern. This is this shows you where, in which regions of Fourier space you are collecting your Fourier coefficients. Um, this is the ground truth image, which basically means is this, the, this is the fully sampled uh, reconstruction. So this is your reference. This is what you are aiming for. Um, on the uh, on the right, what you see is what you would get from such undersampled Fourier measurements if you do a conventional inversion. Uh, for instance, in this last row here, this uh, is called here compressed sensing reconstruction, which means you're reconstructing with, with some kind of L1 penalty again, so with a variational regularization approach. And what you see here in the middle is what comes out of this neural network that is called AutoMap. Okay? So this is just, you know, anecdotally, I'm just showing you one result. I'm not going to show you how well this in general performs, but uh, what they show, if you look into this paper, actually they are, they are very competitive, and even uh, in most cases they, they, they show they can reduce the error to the reference with this AutoMap approach. They, of course, also have to pay for this. They have to pay for this with respect to two things, right? If you look at this, First of all, they have to pay, they have to train with a lot of images, 50,000 brain images. <coughs> then they have to train a network with fully connected layers, um, which makes this computationally challenging and also not scalable because of that to image sizes that are clinically relevant, okay? So this really limits the size of the, of the things that you can actually treat with such an approach. But it works. I mean, it's quite amazing that this actually works. Um, for someone working in inverse problems, it's a bit uh, counterintuitive to do something like this because you're completely forgetting all the modeling assumption that you have. You're completely letting, you're letting the network learn to do an inverse Fourier transform, basically, okay? Although you actually know that there should be an inverse Fourier transform somewhere involved. Anyway, so uh, this is what it is. Um, the other approach is learned post-processing. So learned post-processing is doing the following, and I'm again showing you one example um, that I almost randomly picked, but really just almost, because it's again magnetic resonance tomography. So here the idea is you start again with your Fourier measurements, and then you do a very simple inversion, okay? And the very simple inversion uh, in magnetic resonance tomography means you take all the Fourier coefficients you know, you set all the other Fourier coefficients that you don't know to zero, and then it's just a Fourier transform, so you invert, okay? And this is also called the zero filling solution or minimal norm solution, and then you get things like this, okay? Which don't look really good. You get lots of artifacts, and there is still noise and stuff like this in your reconstruction, and then, you'll use, you train a neural network to clean up all the mess that you have created by doing this very simple inversion in the first place, okay? This is the basic thing, and then there are some post-processing steps, but this is not so important here. And then the scenario looks like this. So on the left, you see again the ground truth, the fully sampled reconstruction. Uh, in the middle, you see uh, what you get by this very simple inversion you do initially. And on the right, you see the result after you have cleaned up this uh, simple inversion image with the neural network. Again, this looks great, actually. And uh, what uh, uh, now, what you might notice, and this is not a very systematic thing that I'm that I'm telling you. I think this needs to really be systematically tested at some point. Now, in this paper they trained not with 50,000 images. They trained this with 1,400 images, okay? So you can see already that there might be some advantage of not forgetting everything you know about your measurements. Still, this post-processing is again a bit, um, maybe not totally satisfying, because you are first doing something that we have learned for a long time is maybe not that great, doing the simple inversion, introducing artifacts, and then cleaning up the artifacts as an after effect kind of thing. Another approach are learned iterative schemes. So learned iterative schemes are now trying to interweave the inversion with 
regularization through a neural network. And they're doing this in the following way. And again, I've picked out one example uh, that came out of the group uh, of Ozan Oktem and his PhD student Jonas Adler. Um, so here the idea is that you set up your reconstruction as a finite number of iterations. You could think, and this is also how initially people thought about this, you could think of this as a kind of gradient descent scheme for a variational regularization approach. But now you're not solving a variational regularization approach, you're doing a finite number of iterations, and each of these iterations is now parametrized with a neural network that is called here this lambda theta guy, and the, this network is now not just fed with the previous iterate, but it's also fed with the data and with knowledge about the forward operator by feeding in the gradient of your data discrepancy functional. Okay, and this is really the main difference to what we've seen before. In every iteration, the network is reminded where actually these iterates are coming from by being reminded what the forward operator is and what the measurements are. And now in this scenario, again, the, 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 the amount of training samples that are needed are actually really surprisingly small. Uh, and surprisingly small, again, being an order or even two orders of magnitude smaller than what we initially started with, with these 50,000 images. Okay, so let me also mention, because maybe some of you have heard about this in this context of variational networks. Variational networks that came out of the group of Tom Pock are another example of such learned iterative schemes. Okay, so this is roughly giving you an overview of what is out there. Um, before I go to learning the regularizer, let me say why people in inverse problems are still a bit worried about this. Um, and people in inverse problems are worried because we have worked for such a long time on creating inversion approaches that are stable, that give you stable reconstruction. Stability is a big issue in inverse problems. And now with neural networks, we don't know exactly how, we don't know yet how to make them guaranteed stable, uh, how to guarantee their stability. Um, so we know, you know, many people of you have probably seen this example before. We know of these reports that uh, people are saying if you, for instance, this is for classification, for image classification, a network trained for image classification, there are these systematic perturbations that you can apply to images such that the classification totally fails, although visually they, the, the two images look the same. And this is not just for classification, but also for reconstruction. People are reporting now similar kind of instabilities that are arising. This is not a reason not to use them, though, because I think this is all a kind of a development that is going on, and there are uh, people who are thinking about uh, stabilizing neural networks, right? So this is a kind of, this is a development that is going hand in hand somehow. And uh, we have seen already in the morning session today some approaches and some ideas of how to make neural networks more stable. Anyway, so we are not there yet. We are not yet there to really uh, know a uh, kind of systematic way to make neural networks stable. So uh, that was a kind of motivation for us to think about not replacing the variational model with the neural network, but to enhance the variational model with the neural network, okay? And I'm going to show you this example that we worked on. There are also other examples, maybe uh, one notable one came out of the group of uh, uh, Markus Haltmeier in Innsbruck, uh, which is also called the net approach. So if you want to look at that, that's also interesting, but I'm going to show you now this example of learning a regularizer in, in an adversarial fashion, which was also the talk that Sebastian was, um, was giving this morning. So this is now joint work with Ozan Oktem from KTH and uh, Sebastian Lunds. And let me say that Sebastian really is the mastermind behind all of this. So if you're looking for a good postdoc to hire in a couple of years, he is uh, great. So anyway, so. Um, Again, so what we want to do is uh, we want to solve still a variational model. Um, so we want to use a variational regularization approach like this one to solve an inverse problem like this, okay? Um, 
But uh, what I now want to show you is how you could think as one option, how you could think to now learn this regularizer with a neural network approach, okay? So, um, well, so motivation, which is actually not written down here, but I'm going to tell you uh, two things. So, the motivation is kind of twofold. On the one hand, the motivation is we want to stick to a, to a variational model because we have, in a very explicit way, we have the power to introduce knowledge about the forward operator, okay? We still keep it in there, right? So this I'm going to keep, right? So I'm going to keep the discrepancy term. The only thing I'm going to learn is the regularizer. So it's a very explicit way of putting in information about where the inverse problem comes from. Um, the other motivation is that um, if I uh, still solve a variational model like this, I can go back to all this classical theory that is out there, which can tell me about existence of solutions of such models and stability, okay? So these are two kinds of motivations to do this. How do we now learn this regularizer? How do we set it up? And this is the red, the thing that is highlighted here in red. The idea is to design or to train a regularizer that is able to distinguish between solutions I would like this variational method to produce, ideally ground truth solutions, to distinguish between ground truth solutions and solutions which show the kind of typical artifacts we get from the type of inverse problem we want to solve. Okay, the typical type of artifacts we might get if we do simple inversion techniques like the zero filling solution I've shown for MRI, or in computer tomography, these are the examples I'm going to show you now, uh, in computer tomography, these streak artifacts that people are seeing if they use uh, things like filter back projection, okay? And how do we do this? So we do this in the following way. So now, on top is again my variational regularization approach. Now I'm going to replace this regularizer by something that is parametrized, and this is going to be my neural network. The neural network now, in contrast to what I've shown before, the neural network now takes as an input uh, an X, which is an Rn, for instance, and uh, as an output, you have some real value, right? This should be uh, some, uh, some evaluation criterion on how good or bad this image is. And in particular, the regularizer should be small for images that we want to reconstruct and should be large for images we want to not to reconstruct, right? Because we're looking for a minimizer of this thing. Um, and how do we now train this? What is an appropriate loss function to train something like this? Well, the idea is that we, that we train this regularizer now in a distributional way. So what we do is we design two distributions, empirical distributions then in fact, practically, one of them contains typical examples, samples of ground truth images. That is my distribution pi. And the other distribution, my distribution rho, contains images that I really don't like, that are showing these typical artifacts that, uh, that I know my inverse problem produces. And this distribution you could design by taking measurements uh, uh, typical measurements uh, of your inverse problem, and then uh, applying a simple inversion to these measurements, okay, like filtered back projection, for instance. And then <clears throat> uh, we are training a regularizer with the following conceptual idea. We are going to, if we evaluate this regularizer for images that come from pi, from this distribution of images that, uh, of the, uh, distribution of ground truth images, we want the regularizer to be small. And if we feed it with uh, images that come from the distribution row, we want it to be large. So this is why we take a minus here, okay? And actually, we don't really do exactly this. What we do is we uh, use uh, an approximation to the Wasserstein distance, to the one Wasserstein distance as a loss function, which uh, is motivated by some uh, by a proposal where people have used uh, the Wasserstein distance actually to generate images in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the context of generative adversarial networks, where additionally to what I've seen, what I've shown before, we also add a, um, um, we also add a penalty to the loss function that makes my regularizer one Lipschitz. 
And this is also nice because this also helps us actually to prove something afterwards about our variation regularization approach. And so this is now the last thing I'm going to show you before I show you the examples. Um, now, what, once we have trained this regularizer in this fashion, uh, we plug it back into our variational approach. And then we have some properties now. Um, because we still are solving a variational model, we can prove that this, uh, uh, the, this, uh, uh, this functional, this minimization problem actually has a solution. And we can uh, also prove, although in a very weak fashion, we can prove some stability results. And I've written down here under appropriate assumptions, so you need to work a little bit in order to uh, get this regularizer to be coercive for the kind of inverse problems that we want to solve. Okay, so this is just to remind you of what we do. We train the regularizer now on empirical distributions um, in this fashion so we, with this loss function, then we plug it back in. Okay, so how does it look? So what you see here is the following. On the very left, okay, let me use the cursor because otherwise it's difficult. Um, on the very left, this is now computer tomography, which is similar as before. So you see the, these type of measurements look similar to what we've seen for positron emission tomography. It's a similar inverse problem. <coughs> Not exactly the same. Um, this is the ground truth. Um, this is uh, what we get with the simple inversion technique, the filtered back projection. This is a typical example of images that we put into the distribution row. Um, this is what you get with uh, total variation regularization. Mm -hmm. So this is a reconstruction uh, with a total variation regularization approach. This is what you get with this post-processing idea. So you first do a simple inversion like this one, and then you use a neural network to clean up this image. And the very right one is the one that comes out of this variation regularization approach with the learned regularizer, okay? So zooming into this a little bit, this is again the ground truth. This is what comes out from the variational regularization with um, the learned regularizer. This is on the left here now the filtered back projection, so the simple inversion. This is, you know, just to give you an idea of how, how, uh, how noisy actually this, uh, this, uh, this example is. This is what comes out with TV, so the typical type of TV solutions that you know, the total variation, so with these blocky, uh, with this kind of piecewise constant approximation of your solution. This is what comes out of the post-processing. And maybe the, the only thing uh, to highlight here is a little bit that maybe the adversarial regularizer gives you a bit of a sharper image back, right, than the post-processing. If you compare that uh, quantitatively, um, okay, the learned approaches are better than the knowledge-driven approaches like filtered back projection or total variation. This is now an, ev an evaluation of the reconstruction with respect to the peak signal to noise ratio, which is a typical type of quality measure for images. The higher, the better. Um, and these two are the learned reconstructions, the deeply learned reconstructions. This is with the, with the learned regularizer and this is with post-processing. So still post-processing is a bit better, but remember two things, and now I'm going to finish with this, remember two things. Um, the learned regularizer, first of all, we are, we are still solving a variational approach, so we have some stability theory supporting this. And uh, the, uh, the, the learned regularizer is trained in a fashion that uh, I've, I've shown, I've uh, written down before in an unsupervised fashion. It's trained in an unsupervised fashion in the following sense, namely that uh, the loss function evaluates only, uh, is, is only an, uh, uh, an evaluation with respect to the distribution of these images. So it doesn't compare directly one image to another one, okay? Which means that you don't need the images in this distribution row and the images in the distribution pi to be paired. And this is a really cool thing in, uh, to, to, to have for inverse problems in practice, because very often we actually really don't have the ground truth. We don't have access to the ground truth. We can't do these full, fully sampled measurements. Very often we don't. Um, there is a big disadvantage of the learned regularizer in contrast to all the other three classes that I've shown you is the, the computational one. 
because solving variational models is still much more expensive than the neural network, once it's trained, it's instantaneous. Okay, so this is a big advantage of all these deeply, uh, these learned iterative schemes and stuff like this to solve inverse problems that they make inverse problems really computationally very feasible. All right, so to finish, let me just say, I think a way forward with all of this is really to, in particular for people like myself uh, coming from inverse problems, is to bring the two worlds a bit closer to each other and not to turn to one extreme or the other one. I think one should really take advantage of the fact that these deep neural networks um, can, are really able to adapt and to find image models that are very adaptive to the type of structures that these images show. Uh, really much richer than what, what we could ever model but still, it's good to have some guarantees in the solution, so, yeah. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about all of this, there is actually an Acton America paper that we have written, which will come out soon. I have a preprint, we are still correcting things, but if you want to have it, please let me know. Uh, and also tell me any mistakes you find, because we can still correct them. And Actually, again to say, I've seen also at this conference that see, there are many people here are working on inverse problems and there are lots of mini symposia that are related to inverse problems, but also to ideas of how to use machine learning in the physical sciences, which really try to think about how to bring modeling and learning closer together. And with that, I thank my group in Cambridge. They really, without them, this, it wouldn't be possible that I'm standing here. Um, and uh, just taking this opportunity for a hiring and advertising campaign. Uh, we have a two-year postdoc position in Cambridge, so if you're interested, please let me know. Um, and the advertising campaign is that a very good colleague of mine, actually the colleague with whom I started this journey from bi-level optimization to neural networks, is organizing a conference in Quito next year. And uh, I've been to this conference now already three times. It's a great conference. And Quito, I've also been there. It's wonderful. So put this into your calendar if you're interested. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming with us to speak, um, Dr. Shunlieb. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to come up to the microphones to address just a couple minutes of questions. And of course, you can always come up after and address the speaker if we don't have time. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so th thanks for the talk. Um, did you, I'm sorry if I missed this, but uh, could you learn the missing Fourier data? And would that be something that fits into these contexts? Yes, so actually, uh so Jim, you're, do, you're saying exactly what these people, the post-processing people have done. <laughs> because in this last step here, that I said is not so important, they actually put in the known Fourier coefficients and they just use the learning for filling up the unknown Fourier coefficients. Okay, now I don't see you anymore, but that's what they do. Ah, yeah. So, yeah, this is this answering your So this is basically what they do, in fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question, which is, um, I noticed in the most recent method that you showed that your team is working on, the error shift seemed to me, just by appearance, it was quite easy to see, but slightly fuzzy. Is that a different kind of error? In other words, is the nature of your error slightly different than the error of the other methods? And would that make it more beneficial for some applications than others? Yeah, so I think what you see here in particular when you compare the, the learned regularizer with yeah. the post-processing one, you see that this is a, this is a bit sharper, right? Yeah. So it depends, right? So it depends. The fuzzy one maybe gives you a bit more uh, notion of uncertainty of where your things are. The, the, this one gives you a bit of a, this is one example of how the solution could look. Right? Yeah. So it depends what you yeah. want. Yeah. yeah. OK, interesting. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, I have a two-in-one question. So one is, when you train your regularizer, how do you enforce its coercive? And mm -hmm. the second one is, is it also convex? No, it's okay. So it's not convex, surely not. 
Uh, how do you enforce its coercive? There are different ways. One thing, so we, I don't have a very good answer to that. One thing that we've tried, that Sebastian tried, was to do a recursive training. So the reason why the regularizer is not coercive, because it can overshoot. Uh, and so one thing to do to, to actually prevent the regularizer to overshoot is to feed back solutions, so to train the regularizer, then put this regularizer into the variational model, solve the variational model for a couple of uh, data points, and then put the solutions of the variational model back into the distribution row and retrain the regularizer and do this. But the reason why it's not a very good answer is because I have no idea whether this converges or not. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. We have time for one quick, quick question. Oh, we've got two here. <laughs> well, you were there for, go ahead. Okay, so um, a Bayesian uh, perhaps would say that uh, um, you're using uh, new images to, to generate a prior, and then, yeah. and then, of course, you could, in principle, do uh, a Bayesian inference. So the question is, um, well, actually, directly, so does your um, method gives you uh, an uncertainty on the, on the final image? Gives you, gives you what? Uncertainty, an uncertainty estimate? No, I'm still, so as, no. But there are people who are using, who are looking at uh, using similar ideas to the learned iterative reconstruction ideas uh, to do uncertainty quantification. So I don't have an uncertainty, no. Uh, but you could do sim other things as well with neural So people are looking into that, yes. Let's thank the speaker one more time for a great talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>